Well, thanks so much for touching on that. And you mentioned briefly about molecular classification. Uh, sure, we are not completely there, but what does that molecular classification look like for endometrial cancer and truly how it impacts your decision making process for a treatment standpoint? Yeah, I mean, first I can talk about the diagnosis. You know, this the good news is, is this is now NCCN listed recommendations or a European listed recommendations. So we often can get these tests as standard of care. But, you know, the first the first analysis we need to do is determine if the patient has a poly mutation. That's our first kind of separation. Then we look at mismatch repair, looking to see if the tumor is mismatch repair deficient or proficient using typically immunohistochemical markers for, you know, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. And after that, then we've been based on P53, either the presence of a mutation or evidence of wild type. And that can can be done by IHC if we're needing to, to not do next-gen sequencing because of cost and other issues, or it can be confirmed utilizing next-gen sequencing. So that's the way that we separate mm -hmm. them. It's still a little bit of work in progress how we're using that to define the, the patient in front of us and to define the treatment that's that's ideal. If you look at the new FIGO staging, they do actually incorporate molecular testing. It's pretty controversial because of that concern that not everywhere, one everywhere all over the world can get the next gen sequencing that's necessary for that poly assessment and P53 assessment. But with that being said, there's a growing um, cadre of data to say that perhaps patients or and patients with tumors that have a poly mutation, a true poly mutation, may not need as much or may not need any therapy that they may do well no matter what um, you do. And conversely, that pa patients that have tumors that harbor a P53 mutation may need to have a more aggressive therapy and may benefit from, you know, additional treatments outside of, say, surgery in the early stage disease or um, outside of, uh, you know, say, chemotherapy and late stage disease. And so I think it's still a little bit of a work in progress, but for the purposes of the community oncologist, if you're able to get next gen sequencing, that's outstanding. Okay. I wouldn't at this point not treat a patient with a poly mutation just because I don't think we quite have enough data. Um, but I might consider, you know, that additional adjuvant therapy in the presence of a P53 mutation. We can certainly talk about that a little bit more as we talk about some of the treatment strategies. Absolutely. I think a few things to dissect here. In the community, we're so used to looking for these NGS mutations, be it for lung cancer and not for colon cancer. So at least in my practice, this often ends up being moving forward with NGS rather than looking for pinpoint mutations. And we'll dive into this a little later as well, because now we have more and more bucket approvals as well, be it for HER2 or NTREC. So keeping that information granted for metastatic disease also ends up being very important. So Shannon, coming back to the early stage, be it because of the histology or molecular classification, we often divide these patients in low, intermediate risk, and then high risk. You also touched on minimally invasive surgery. That's great for our patients because they're quickly recovering for that potential adjuvant treatment. So in your practice, based on the molecular classification or histology, how are you deciding who gets adjuvant treatment and what kind of adjuvant treatment? Yeah, right now, in general, we're utilizing just the typical pathologic features. So, you know, depth of invasion, grade, and the presence of lymphovascular space invasion. But what we're learning really, especially with early stage, like stage 1A or early grade 1B, um, that probably less is more. And so the majority of those patients likely can and will have just as good outcomes if we observe them and watch them closely rather than utilizing adjuvant therapy. However, depending on kind of the overarching look at risk factors, and this is kind of the combination. So grade two, let's say, of itself is probably not enough, but grade two in the setting of deeper invasion or in the setting of lymphovascular space invasion, maybe somebody that didn't have lymph nodes assessed, then we may be more likely to add something like adjuvant um, radiotherapy. And specifically in these early stage, early grade, we'd be looking at vaginal cuff brachytherapy. 
it's when we push into exactly what you said, that inner high intermediate risk, the high, higher risk, which is the deep invasion, the grade three is stage two for sure. Um, that's when we start saying, okay, at the very least, we're going to use um, pelvic radiotherapy or cuff brachytherapy with chemo. And there was actually a pretty nice study that looked at that. It didn't find any benefit as far as survival for, you know, what we confectionately call cuff and chemo versus um, full pelvic radiotherapy. But surprisingly, at least to us, was that the full, full pelvic radiotherapy actually had less side effects than the cuff and chemo. I think we were all <laughs> expecting the opposite. Um, I will say that this is a discussion I have with the patients in clinic. 